everyone, and welcome to a long overdue night of Astronomy on Tap here in Kingston. We haven't had an event since I think it's been May now, and I have to admit I was a bit busy over the summer, maybe enjoying the nice nights and the clear skies. And so now that we're getting darker nights, I thought it's time for another Astronomy on Tap. So if you don't know me, I'm Mark Richardson, the Education and Outreach Officer for the Arthur B. McDonald Canadian National Particle Physics Research Institute. And that's a collection of scientists, universities, and research labs across Canada uncovering some of the biggest mysteries of the universe by looking at some of its smallest things. And so I'm here tonight in Kingston, Ontario. I'm a galactic astronomer. I study how galaxies form and change over time. And so I'm so excited to hear from the different visitors that are joining us today. They're going to take us on a tour of facilities present and future that will be really instrumental in illuminating more of the unknown nature of the cosmos. And so I love taking these kinds of opportunities like tonight to share astronomy with you all. These events are opportunities to share with you how amazing and exciting and useful science is in overcoming big problems. And of course, I'm so happy that even with us being remote, people are able to join in live or maybe after the fact. And just want to let you all know that as we are starting the plan to come back in person events at pubs, we're still going to try to find ways to have people join in online at the same time. And so thanks again to all of you joining from home, whatever lands you call home. And so for me, home is the lands of the Kataraqui. It's now Kingston. That's the traditional land of Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples and many Indigenous peoples before them. And I'm truly appreciative that we are all able to learn tonight from our respective lands. My settler ancestors actually come from Scotland and France, coming to Turtle Island through the process of colonialism. And I was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, the traditional land of the Eskikawak, or the skin dressers territory of the Mi'kmaq. I recognize that my ancestors played a role in removing them from their stewardship of this land. And then personally, as an astronomer, someone who really revels in the wonder of the land, the planet, the skies, and the universe, I recognize that this science relies on facilities that use traditional and sacred lands of various indigenous peoples, peoples who have a voice to add to the science and who should be gatekeepers to those spaces. And so I reflect on these aspects of my identity and how they afford me privileges in my academic life. And so to all of you, I urge you to think of the connection you have with the land around you and the gift that we all have to learn wherever we are, including the access to dark skies above us, which I think is actually fitting right now because it allows us to appreciate yesterday's full moon. We have great views of Saturn and Jupiter right now visible in the evening. And so I encourage you after tonight's event, maybe to explore websites and resources like native.land.ca and learn about the past peoples who have lived where you live. So moving forward, let's reflect on and work towards the decolonization of these spaces to make them ones of friendship, love, and access for all of those in our community. So the plan for tonight is simple. It's, it's meant to be a conversation really between, um, between us, more than just a lecture. And so I hope that you guys are all able to chime in from the comments. I find the best way to do this is if you don't do full screen for the video, but maybe keep that live feed playing next to you, and then you can kind of get engaged that way. So uh, feel free to grab a drink, open your minds and your imaginations, and uh, say hello from the comments sections. Let us know where you're joining from. And tonight, we're going to hear from three astronomers and physicists who all do very exciting but quite different research. Um, we're also going to have some trivia tonight with prizes. Um, and I know some people in the audience have had these before, and so we'll be sending out some uh, Medallion Suit uh, mugs, as you can see on screen. Now, before we get the ball rolling on um, our three speakers, I do want to highlight, in particular tonight, um, some of the sponsors we've had through the ages, um, and we are, you know, gearing up to hopefully return um, to some of these locations and be able to bring out some of the prizes that we've been given from these sponsors. So I want to recognize all of them and the support we get from the Queen's University, Queen's Observatory, and the McDonald Institute. And so to start the proceedings, of course, it's been, geez, five months now. And so, you know, there must be lots of exciting news from space. So the first off is you might've noticed lately that there's been a lot of billionaires going to space. <laughs> And so while this is clearly a demonstration of, I think, significant privilege, it must be said that this could be a, maybe a sign of things to come. So um, we also, we had uh, Richard Branson went up on July 11th in 2021. Um, and then 
I think it was 10, yeah, 10 days later, nine days later, we had uh, Jeff Bezos um, head off to space with a few other people. And that trip was kind of interesting. Um, it included both the youngest person to ever go to space, that was an 18 year old student, um, included Jeff's brother, but it also included uh, Wally Funk, who is seated here, who at 82 years of age was the oldest person to go to space at the time. More on that in a second. Um, and uh, she was among the first um, in her career. Uh, she was actually part of the Messenger 13, so one of the first kind of aeronautical uh, uh, women really in this in, in this field. Um, of course, there were just billionaires that went to space. We also had Captain Kirk himself, uh, William Shatner. He went to space just last week, um, and I think he's 90, I heard. So he's actually now the newest, oldest person to go to space. Um, and we've also had other new things like uh, movie actresses from Russia going to the International Space Station with directors and whatnot. So there's all these kind of exciting things happening with space right now. Um, and so I think that um, all of this may, you know, hopefully pave the way for future tourism to space, which maybe could help bring costs down, change, you know, what barriers exist for us being able to go to space and really change maybe how we think about space travel. The other thing that happened really recently was the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded. So this was back on October 5th, so a couple of weeks back. And so the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2021 was awarded for groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of complex systems, with one half jointly going to uh, Suyakuru Manabe, and then the other half going uh, the, uh, and split between Suyakuru and Klaus Hasselmann for the physical model of uh, Earth's climate quantifying variability and reliability predicting global warming. And then the other half of the prize uh, went to Giorgio Parisi for the discovery of the interplay of disorder and fluctuations in physical systems from atomic to planetary scales. And so uh, Siakuru Manabe's work actually showed how increasing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere leads to increasing temperatures at the surface of the Earth. And so his work dates back to the 1960s. He was one of the first, actually, I think he was the first person to really explore the interactions between radiation and air transport. And his work really was the first step in developing what are today's climate models. And then if you fast forward a decade, uh, Klaus Hasselmann was able to actually then use those models and, and start linking weather models and climate models, showing how climate models can be accurate even when weather models are not. And so Hasselman also determined ways to show one way or another what role human activities were actually affecting in the Earth's climate change, basically how much of the responsibility they had. And then finally in the 1980s, um, Giorgio Parisi, he worked on finding patterns in complex systems and materials, and that had far-reaching implications for lots of fields like physics, mathematics, biology, neuroscience, machine learning, and so on. And so it was a really interesting com combination of, uh, of those Nobel Prizes of Physics. Also a shout out to the Nobel Prize in Economics who went to a Canadian. Um, but yeah, so that was, that was really exciting news to see. And the last bit of space news I'm gonna tell you, which you might think is a little bit old news, but I think it's kind of fitting because of what this event is actually part of. And this actually dates back a little bit to January, 2021, where astronomers uh, Bushman and then others on the publication, they, had, they found a, a pretty surprising result. So they've been looking at neutron stars. These are some of the densest visible objects known today. They're more massive than our sun, but you could basically fit them in Manhattan. And they are the leftovers from the deaths of stars much larger than our own sun. And so neutron stars usually have a tendency of spinning really fast. They can be pulsars or they can be quite, uh, quite very interesting uh, energetic sources of radiation. But what these astronomers did is they found that even for some quieter neutron stars that don't really rotate a lot, there were still more x-rays being emitted than could be explained by our understanding of these cosmic curiosities. And so the scientists suggested that these extra x-rays could be caused by something called axions. This is a theorized particle that's been theorized for a while to, to explain some little quirks in the observations of, of uh, some of the standard model of physics. Um, and so the idea was that maybe these axions are being formed at the center of the neutron star and then interacting with the really strong magnetic fields to make these x-rays, being converted into these x-rays. 
And so if they are right, it turns out these axions could be a pretty good explanation for what dark matter is. And that's a type of matter that makes up 85% of all matter in the universe, and we don't even know what it is. And we're going to hear tonight about some efforts to or, or facilities that are being used to maybe try to understand or shed some light on that dark matter. Um, of course, if this is what it is, we'd like to confirm it. And so there are experiments here on Earth to do that. This is the uh, CERN Axion Solar Telescope over in Geneva. Um, and uh, this is actually looking for axions from the sun um, that maybe would convert into x-rays actually in the machine. And there's future, there's future experiments um, being planned that may be, be even more sensitive than uh, this, this experiment here. And so I wanted to highlight this particular story, even though it predates our last few, um, our last few astronomy on taps, because October and particularly October 31st is dark, dark matter day and month. And so I, I link here, darkmatterday.com. I think it's easy to remember. I encourage you guys at the end of today's event to go check that out. There's lots of other events, lots of them happening online, including one that Snow Lab is involved with um, uh, over at STFC in RAL in the UK. And they're gonna be doing some more in-depth virtual lab tours uh, next week on the 28th. Um, and so I think more information of that can be found under darkmatterday.com and just look at like lists of events near you. So I highly recommend that you head over to there. So, with that being said, I want to uh, thank you again for all tuning in, and I want to introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker is uh, Lamia Mola, and Lamia, do you want to share your camera? And so Lamia is from Dhaka, Bangladesh, and moved to the U.S. for undergraduate studies in astrophysics at Wellesley College, Massachusetts, and then did her PhD at Yale. She is an advocate for equal opportunities in scientific research and education for students from countries with limited access to resources. Lamia has taught in the Yale Young African Scholars, um, is an organizing member of the Pan-African Summer School for Emerging Astronomers, and she founded an after-school program called Bangladesh Science Outreach in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And Dr. Mola is an observational astronomer who studies the structural evolution of massive galaxies in the early universe. Lamy is a Dunlap postdoctoral fellow at the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics, the University of Toronto, and a member of the Canadian NIRIS or NIRISS Unbiased Cluster Survey. Uh, well named the Canucks, <laughs> astronomers in their acronyms. Um, so, this is one of the biggest Canadian programs with the James Webb Space Telescope, which we're going to hear about tonight. And since moving to Toronto, she's been trying to come up with new ways by which we can use everyday technology, such as the cameras on our smartphones, to do science. She also revealed that she is actually on a mission in the Toronto area right now to try out every bubble tea store. Um, and so I encourage all of you that are joining from the Toronto area, maybe put in the chat where she should really start prioritizing next. Um, but with that, uh, Lamia, I'm really, really thrilled for you to be joining us this evening and to be sharing with us some words about JWST. And so I, I look forward to seeing your talk and you can, you can share your screen. Thank you so much, Mark. That was a very generous introduction. All right. All right. Um, I'm guessing you can see my screen now. All right. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining in today. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me in this program. So I moved to Toronto last year in September in the middle of the raging pandemic. And the first place that uh, my partner and I visited uh, after, you know, everything opened up again um, in outside of Toronto after getting fully vaccinated was Kingston. And we loved exploring the area. So I'm really glad that I'm giving my first astronomy on tap at Kingston. And even more glad that I get to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, something that we have all been looking forward to for a really long time now. Um, so what is the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, it is the long awaited successor to the great Hubble Space Telescope, which is being shown here. Um, as you can imagine, the Webb will be a lot more advanced telescope. Um, and that's because Hubble was launched in the 1990 
It was launched in actually April 1990, and it had all the cutting edge latest technologies of the you know late 80s. If you were around then, then you know what these are. So for better or for worse, the technology that we have today have, is far superior to those of the late 80s. And so will be a telescope that is being built now with this knowledge. So it is a worthy successor of the great Hubble Space Telescope, which has been online for three decades now. Um, now, you may have heard of the James Webb Space Telescope on the news, or to be more specific, you may have heard of the delays of the James Webb Space Telescope launch on the news. And it's true. Um, in addition to being one of the most ambitious, most expensive, um, and most powerful telescope ever built by human, it might also be the most delayed one. Um, the idea of the telescope was first conceived in 1996, and um, it was supposed to be have been launched in about 10 years later, so around 10, 2007. Then it got delayed to 2014, to 2016, to 2018, and so long and so forth. And now the astronomers are almost scared to see, even say the date out loud, so I won't say it. Um, so now a 15 year delay might seem like a lot, uh, but considering how long humanity has waited, or to get to this moment, it might be worth it because you want to do it right, right? Um, now, does anyone know when was the first recorded extragalactic observation? Um, that is something that is outside our own Milky Way. When, when was the first one that was recorded? You can feel free to put it down on, um, on the chat. So if you said about a thousand years ago, uh, then you were right. Okay, so the first recorded extragalactic observation dates back to uh, about 964 AD by the Persian astronomer Al-Sufi, who saw a small little smudge in the sky with his naked eye, with no telescope. This is like, this is predates lenses. Um, so he saw a small smudge in the sky that did not look like stars, and he um, he drew it out as a series of small dots. Um, I couldn't tell that was a galaxy. Uh, and um, he didn't know. We didn't know at that time what, is, what galaxy was. So do, do you want to take a guess what that was, what he was looking at? Well, what he was looking at was the Andromeda galaxy, which is our closest neighbor galaxy outside our own Milky Way. Um, so he drew it as a group of points near the mouth of the fish, which is the Andromeda constellation. That's what he was charting out. Um, so that was a thousand years ago. That was before Edwin Hubble established um, the extragalactic universe, that there are other galaxies outside our own Milky Way, which is what we can see here on the screen. Um, so the, the, the view of the Milky Way from the night sky that we cannot definitely see in Tor from Toronto, sorry. Um, I'm gonna turn my, okay. So, sorry, I didn't know there was sound in there. Anyway, um, so the Milky Way uh, galaxy was observed from the sky and uh, you know Hubble Space Telescope and all the other telescopes that came after it uh, was able to see much, much deeper into it. So um, we will be able to observe I'm gonna go back to this slide because I really want to show you uh, the, so this is, you can see the Milky Way and we are now zooming in uh, the Andromeda galaxy over there. So this is what um, Al-Biruni drew, uh, sorry, Al-Sufi drew about a thousand years ago. And now this is a view of the same galaxy using the Hubble Space Telescope. And now you can see that we can actually see, you know, we can differentiate between stars in another galaxy that's outside our own galaxy. Um, so yeah, this is just Hubble showing off now. So yeah, you can see like, these are like all different stars, um, billions of them in another galaxy that is outside our own. And, you know, this is what Hubble has done and Jane, um, James Webb Space Telescope can do a lot better. So 
what can James Webb do? We are going, we are at the uh, brink of, a, we're gonna take another giant leap, one that we took 30 years ago with the Hubble Space Telescope. We are now waiting for another one with the Wave Telescope, which will be able to show us some of the very first galaxies born after the Big Bang. Now, how can it do that? Um, well, uh, how can Webb look back in time? You know, it, it sounds very futuristic. How is it looking? It's not a time machine. Well, actually every telescope um, is a time machine. In fact, every time you look up at the sky, you're looking back in time. And that's because light always travels at the same speed, at the same finite speed. And it takes light the same amount of, um, sorry, not the same. It takes light some time to come from the object from which it is emitted or from the object from which it is reflected like the, our moon to our eye. So for example, when you look at the sun, uh, you are actually seeing how the sun was eight minutes ago because it takes light eight minutes to travel from the sun to our eyes. Um, if you look at you know, our nearest, um, second nearest star after the sun, which is a Proxima Centauri, uh, and Proxima Centauri is about four light years away. So if you're looking at the star tonight, you're seeing something that happened four years ago in 2017. If you wanna see Proxima Centauri, um, you know, how Proxima Centauri looks right now, you have to wait until 2015, uh, sorry, 2025. So that's what we mean by the time travel. Now Andromeda, which we were showing just now, um, is 2.5 million light years away. So the light that we see today, it left Andromeda, um, 2.5 million years ago when human haven't even started making fire. So the deeper we are looking into the sky, the further we're looking back in space and the further uh, back in time we're speaking, uh, we're seeing. So that's what the time travel aspect of the universe, of the telescope is. Now the edge of the universe is about 13.7 billion years old, which means the farthest that we can see um, is the light that left right after the Big Bang, which was about 13.7 billion years ago. So the James Webb Space Telescope is so powerful that it can actually detect signals. It can image galaxies that are 30, over 13 billion years away, the first galaxies that were born after the Big Bang. Um, so what makes Webb so powerful? I mean, one of this is that, you know, we have the very, uh, upgraded technologies that makes it. And the other thing is that it's in the infrared. It's looking at further longer wavelengths than what Hubble saw. So um, the universe is more transparent in the infrared. Um, so the we humans, we see the visible part of the light, right? So we see red, blue, green, all the colors. And Hubble sees from UV to, infra, uh, to near infrared. So what do I mean by more, the universe is more transparent? Well, where there is light, uh, where there is life, there is dust or carbon. So galaxies and stars and planets and us, we are all made out of dust. So wherever there are new stars being formed, wherever there is new planets, galaxies being born, there will be a lot of dust, um, which we cannot see in visible light. You know, like imagine yourself in a smoke screen or in a, to a dust, you cannot see to a dust storm. So here's a nebula which is um, in which there is a lot of baby stars being born, baby stars and planets being born. And all you can see are these like beautiful pillars of dust. You cannot see the, the stars that are being born. Um, but if you look at the same object in the infrared, you will see all these stars, they just magically show up, right? So when you're looking at longer wavelengths, you can see through this dust. And that's what Webb will utilize. It will be able to look in the infrared and peer deeper into the universe through the dust clouds into the um, galaxies and planets and stars that are being born, more so than what Hubble did. Now, I am I study galaxies, so I'm biased. I was, have only been talking about galaxies, but Webb can also study other things. So for example, Webb will be able to study the atmospheres of other planets um, outside our solar system of exoplanets. And it will study the atmosphere to look for signs of life. Um, it can study the life cycles of stars. So it will be able to uh, you know, see stars in its different phases, turning into black holes. It will be able to see the evolution of galaxies in different snapshots of time. And finally, it can peer deep into this space into the earliest galaxies when the first galaxies were formed. 
But you know, before doing that, um, Web will have to take a very perilous 29 days long journey into the state, uh, into the space. So it will go much, much further than Hubble. It will be launched on a um, on a rocket, Ariane 5, and it will go uh, travel 1.5 kilometers from the Earth to Lagrange Point 2. It is a point where there is um, the suns and the arts gravitational field are cancel out, so it's at the minimum. Um, and then it will, you know, it will continue. So as you can see uh, in the bottom panel here, you can see that the uh, telescope just left the moon. Um, so it will be able to actually uh, go past the moon at twice the speed that the Apollo space mission took it. I think it took it like one bit. So you can see that we are now on the third day of the mission. Uh, it has already gone past the moon. The sun shields are coming out. The telescope is slowly getting deployed. So it's such a large telescope. It's almost the size of a tennis court. And it, it will be like folded like an origami into small, into a very small, tiny thing. And then it will be folded inside the rocket and then shot into space. So when it goes into the space, as it is traveling to L2, it is slowly unfolding. Um, the sun shields are coming out because it's an IR, it's an infrared telescope, so it has to be kept cool. You know, you don't want it to heat it up from the sun's rays. That's why the sun shield is there. Um, it's continuing. Uh, what just opened up right now is actually it's a steering system. That's what it keeps it in place. Um, you can see that we are on the eighth. We're already gone past the eleventh day. Now the secondary mirror is coming out. So light actually comes, hits the primary mirror, goes into the secondary mirror, and then goes into through this peephole over here. And then behind here is are all the instruments. Um, so the cameras, the spectrographs, all the all the instruments that will be taking the images and taking the spectras that are coming out. Um, from the objects. And we are already on the day 29. So it has reached L2, 1.5 million, kilo, uh, million kilometers from Earth. Um, and it will be or orbiting the Earth and the sun along uh, for, you know, it's a five-year mission. So we're really looking forward to it. So, you know, it's happening. It's, we're almost there. Hopefully very soon, uh, Web this month, Web just was shipped from uh, the uh, California to the Panama Canal across the ocean, all the way to French Guiana from which it will be launched. Um, you know, if you are a big fan of watching unboxing videos on YouTube, here's the mother of all unboxing. Here's a $10 billion telescope getting unboxed. Um, and here they are, here it is being taken out and it will, for the next two months, it will go through a series of tests um, and hopefully we will stay on schedule. Now, Canada has played a huge part in building the web. Uh, one of the four major instruments on board is NIRIS, uh, the Near Infrared Imager and Slip uh, Spectrograph, as well as the Fine Guiding Sensor, which were both, both built here in Canada at the University of Montreal and at NRC Harrisburg. Uh, so Canada also built the fine guiding sensor of Hubble and it's been in service for 30 years. So we're in good hands. Um, and if all goes well, the web will be launched at the end of this year. So this holiday season, wherever you are, look out for the launch as astronomers put all their eggs in one basket and shoots it into space. And for the next five years, just sit back and watch the universe unfold in the eyes of web. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just had this this picture of putting all these carefully fragile <laughs> eggs into a basket and then like be good and then launching it. <laughs> it sounds scary. Well, thank you so much for that talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mark. So yeah, it's an extremely nervous time for everyone. <laughs> I can imagine. I'm, we're, there's been some talk in the chat a little bit about Lucy, which was just launched and I think has a similar mechanism with this, this tarp. And it sounds like they ran into a little bit of a snag, but they might mm -hmm. be making, making do with the issue. Um, so we, we do have some questions coming in that I have for you. And so the first comes from Craig Jones. And so he was wondering if, and we all know we don't like to ask these questions and he asks your apology. 
But if something bad happens, what happens next? Do they have a, a second one ready to go? Is there like, is there a plan B? <laughs> there is no plan B. Um, wow. And that's why they have taken so long to, to make sure that everything is in place. It took, it took thir- uh, 25 years to build, you know, they thought they will do it in 10, but it took 25. Um, there are a lot of safety mechanisms that they can do from here to troubleshoot, but unlike Hubble Space Telescope, which was in orbit um, uh, about 600 kilometers above the Earth and you can actually send manned spacecraft and astro- astronauts to go fix it, there is, no one can go this far. That's just simply not possible. There is no manned mission um, in place. So everything just has to go right. Uh, and they're just taking their time to make sure that everything is in place and, you know, hope for the best. And, and the next mission is the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. Um, and that's, um, I think it currently it's 2030. That's the goal. Yeah. But, you know, before then, uh, in terms of near uh, mid-infrared telescope, this is it. Wow. Yeah, Craig also had a follow-up question, which was whether or not it could be serviceable, but I guess you just answered that one. <laughs> I can't, yeah, it's very different than Hubble, isn't it? And when you think, like, Hubble needed to be serviced before it actually was able to work, right? Th- that's true, yeah. yeah. So Hubble had a, a, a problem in its secondary mirror, um, and I think for two years uh, they were trying to figure out how to solve it, and they came up with a quick patch, which was, like, they came up with a way of correcting for the blurry images that Hubble was giving out. Uh, but at the end, they just had to send a manned mission two years mm-hmm. later. And they that that's when that's one of the images that I showed, which was uh, the uh, the astronaut going in um, to fix the telescope. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So there's a question from Sean here, um, and just will JWST allow us to better view planets in our own solar system? Um, I realize it's it's you know he he recognized that it's designed for viewing things more distant and far away, but is there any kind of cool science it can do here in the solar system? I know that there are a lot of work happening to look at the moons of Jupiter um, to better study the. Um, atmosphere of the planets inside our solar system as well. So it, it is a high resolution, high, high sensitivity, um, mid infrared telescope uh, with, you know, imager and spectrograph. So anything that you can do with it, you can, you can point it at anything and take images and spectra of anything. So definitely all the way from uh, solar system to, you know, the earliest galaxies are all going to be visible. And yeah, you can all go into the JWST website and they talk about what are the uh, solar, uh, solar system projects that are going to be um, underway in the first year of the mission. Hmm. I'm curious for you, given the science that you, you're you interested in, what do you think is like the first result that you're the most eager to see come out of JWST? Um, we're all just waiting to be surprised, uh, mm-hmm. Mark. I think that's what we are most excited about, well, m- waiting for the most, because when, when they took the Hubble ultra deep field image, they had no idea that they were going to see these millions of galaxies, you know, mm-hmm. zooming through it. They thought that, oh, why, why will anyone point at a blank field of the sky? What will you see? Um, so if you ask me like what I am most, wait, like what am I waiting for is something that we did not expect at all. That's mm-hmm. what I am waiting for. Yeah, that sounds exciting. There's a question from Kevin. He says that Canadian astronomers have time uh, for JWST observations. Do you have any idea of some of the very first selected targets that that are likely to come out of that time? Yeah, so I am in the Canucks team, which has 200 hours of guaranteed time. So uh, kind of... uh, Anyone who built an instrument on the telescope gets some uh, guaranteed time. And Canada, because they built nearest, they, I think, have about 500 hours in total. And so 200 hours of that is uh, studying the galaxies. And then there is another 
uh, 200 hours for studying exoplanets. Um, that's from University of Montreal. They are leading that. So what we are looking at are actually galaxy clusters, uh, which are um, going to, you know, the gravitational lensing will be able to uh, magnify even uh, more the further mm -hmm galaxies. And that's, I think that's one of the key ways by which we will be able to find the first galaxies because you need even higher sensitivity. So, uh, you know, that that's what we're really waiting for is the first galaxy mm -hmm. in the universe through the, yeah, through looking at these clusters. That's incredible. So I think I need to double check that there might be just one more question, which is from Kevin. Oh no, that's the question I just read. Sorry, it's from Tony. Is all of the deployment automated um, or does it rely on instructions coming in you know, roughly as it goes from Earth? Uh, from what I understand, it is all, you know, it's a series of instructions. Like they will just keep on doing one by one, but uh, there is a way of, they are also communicating um, it, it does take time for signals to go back and forth mm -hmm. between the telescope and the Earth. So um, all the deployment is fully automated, but right. there might be some troubleshooting parts that may need some uh, people from the space station to go in and take a look. I see. Yeah, it's not it's not quite as bad as say as landing on Mars, where like it's eleven minutes <laughs> away by light and. Yeah, but this is a little bit closer, but it's interesting to hear that it's still automated. There is there is one more question that came up, which is from Sean, which is just how far do they expect JWST to be able to see? Um, or how clear are you going to be able to view something with this new telescope? Um, so it is about, in terms of sensitivity, it, it, it varies with which part of the wavelength, uh, which part of the spectrum you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So the further, um, it has a really high resolution at like shorter wavelengths and very uh, not so great resolution at the, the longer you go. In terms of how far we can see, that also again depends on um, what, so if you're looking, talking about directly a photon coming from that galaxy uh, or from that object to our telescope, um, then it might be, I would say like 30, uh, 12 billion years or so, or wow. 11, 11 billion light years away. Uh, but Again, like we are looking, we are using the gravitational field of the cluster uh, clusters to lens to you know ten times, twenty times magnify the signals, um, and with using that, that's how we can go like that extra one billion light year and look at the thirteen point five light billion yeah, years and the first galaxies. Yeah. Cool. So there's one little last question that got snuck in and I'm putting you on this. Well, it's not me. It's not my fault. This is <laughs> Mazadin Manan asked the question, putting you on the spot. Optimistically speaking, how soon do you think it can be that we would see like the public or, you know, see the first images coming from JDWST? Yeah, uh, that's a good question, Mazadin. Um, so it will take about six months um, for the mm -hmm. deployment. Uh, well, okay, tw 29 days for deployment, right? And then another six months for calibrations and checks. So we are expecting data to come in about seven, six to seven months after launch. So I would say like mid next year or mm -hmm. so. Um, and the first data that comes out is going to go public just like that. Um, it's no one has um, any proprietary on that. So those are the early release signs and mm -hmm. those images, everyone is ready. We have all our reduction pipelines ready. You know, the photon needs to come and the image is going to be crunched out. So <laughs> can't wait. It'll be like a second Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. I think we will have you back at the end. We're going to have uh, all the speakers come back and I think there's still a few little questions coming in, but I do want to move on, but I want to thank you so much for this amazing talk. And I just, I can't wait for I can't wait for two more months. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Right. Take care. So, do -do -do. going to share my screen because 
We have our first round of trivia. So, and I just had this ready too. Okay, this might get a little bit weird for a moment. Make sure that you guys see the link. I'm just gonna put it in the chat. So you can fill in your, um, your trivia answers onto that link. It's also in the description of the video. We're gonna do the first round of trivia, it's just five questions. And then we're gonna come back for our second, our second speaker. And so trivia round one, you know that these are usually a mix of some science and some pop culture science, um, science arguable. Um, and so I hope you have a good time. And of course you can compete for that amazing mug and we'll be giving away two. So the first question is, which Renaissance scientist is credited with the discovery of the pendulum's length period relation? And this ultimately led to the pendulum clock. Which Renaissance scientist would that be? And the question is, well, no, those are artists. I was thinking like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, typically think, I think Renaissance, and I think their names. And I'll be repeating every one of these questions one more time. So I'm gonna move on to question number two. Who first formulated that all matter is made of particles? And we'll, there's basically two answers that we might accept here. So who first formulated that all matter that we know of is made of particles? All right, question number three. Which planet has a hexagonal shaped storm? With some debate about why the heck that is. Which planet has a hexagonal shaped storm? All right, question number four. Name this scientist. Who's that amazing set of teeth? Name the scientist. And the last question for this round, and I'm gonna repeat them all one more time, is which of the following TV shows or movies do not allow people to travel faster than light? And here I count any kind of wormhole or jumping, that counts as moving faster than light. And so the options are A, Star Wars, B, Battlestar Galactica, C, Star Trek, D, Firefly, and E, The Expanse. Which of the following TV shows or movies do not allow people to travel faster than light? And that's it for round one. So let's go through them one more time. So which Renaissance scientist is credited with the discovery of the pendulum's length period relation? This is what led to the pendulum clock. Question two, who first formulated that all matter is made of particles? Who was it? When was it? Question three, which planet has a hexagonal shaped storm? And I'll give you a hint. It is a planet in our solar system. <laughs> Question four is name this scientist who is pictured here, scientist and author. And last but not least, for question number five, of round one of trivia, which of the following TV shows or movies do not allow people to travel faster than light? And this includes other kind of weird things like jumps or wormholes. It's that Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, Star Trek, Firefly, or The Expanse. Which of them? All right, so we'll come back for round two after our next speaker. So at this point, I would love to welcome CJ to show his video. And I think, hello, CJ. So our next speaker is CJ Whitford, who's a colleague of mine. Uh, he is the Knowledge Translation Specialist with the McDonald Institute and an Educational Content Developer with Discover the Universe. CJ completed his PhD in Physics from the University of Toronto in the fall of 2020. And he did this working on simulations of binary black holes and contributing to the gravitational wave detection and analysis pipeline. 
CJ was instrumental in working with Discover the Universe to actually make viewing the recent solar eclipse that happened in the summer much more accessible for many Canadians. And he's already getting a head start for the amazing solar eclipse that's coming to here in Kingston and a lot of North America in 2024. Um, CJ no longer is focusing on research, but he does continue to be jazzed about gravitational wave detection and multi-messenger astrophysics. And I do want to say one thing, that depending on exactly how you found out about tonight's event, you might have heard that we were having Stefan Corto, who's going to be talking about the Vera Rubin telescope. That talk will be moved to another, another astronomy on tap in the coming days, so another facility we have to look forward to. But today we have really the honor and privilege to hear from CJ talking about gravitational wave observatories. And so CJ, I'm so happy to have you here and to hang out with you uh, outside of the office, but um, and, and hear from you. And so I encourage you to share your screen and I look forward to hearing about uh, LIGO and gravitational wave observatories. Oh, well, thank you, Mark. And as Mark mentioned, I just really wanna emphasize that uh, I do no longer do active research in gravitational waves but I'm still really excited to talk to you about gravitational wave science, the detection that goes behind it, and also what's to come in terms of gravitational waves and their detectors. But before we can talk about gravitational wave detectors and what's coming next, we kind of need to start with gravitational waves and what they are. And if you're talking about gravitational waves, you might have to start with that gravitational part, which kind of implies gravity. So we have to start with this idea of space-time or a fabric that kind of exists throughout the entire universe that includes time and our spatial dimensions. And the first thing I really want you to remember about space-time is that matter tells space-time how to curve. The curvature in space-time tells us a lot about the gravity that matter exerts, and usually what we see is the more matter that exists in a small amount of space, so these really dense objects, um, stars are really dense, neutron stars are even denser, and black holes are some of the densest things we know about, create very extreme curvature. You can think about that in the same way that the more extreme the curvature, the more gravity an object has. So matter tells space-time how to curve. It's related to their gravity and it's related to the mass as well as to their density. And likewise, space-time tells matter how to move. So matter in space-time is also following these curvatures. This is partially how you can think about orbits. So the sun creates a much deeper curvature in space-time than the earth does. And that's because the sun is more dense, it's because it has this more mass, and Earth follows along its orbit due to that curvature in space-time that the sun's mass creates. But we're not here to talk about the sun and the Earth, we're here to talk about black holes. <laughs> so black holes being some of the most extreme objects in our universe are causing some of the most extreme types of curvature. And in this simulation, you see two black holes orbiting around each other and the space-time underneath being very extremely curved. These black holes are moving around each other, orbiting around each other, what we also call a binary black hole, due to their own curvature in space-time. When very extreme objects like black holes are moving around each other, causing this extreme curvature in space-time, they often have ripples in space-time moving away from them. And in this simulation, especially as these black holes start merging, you see that highlighted in the background as dark blue and fuchsia. These ripples in space-time, so this is what's causing the curvature in space-time as these things are moving, these are the waves that are moving away. These ripples in space-time are what we call gravitational waves. And it's these ripples in space-time, these gravitational waves, that's what we're listening to, to hear compact objects orbiting around each other, such as binary black holes. Okay, so now we have a better idea of gravity, space-time, and gravitational waves. We're doing pretty good. <laughs> so really any kind of matter moving through space-time, especially anything that's orbiting, will cause gravitational waves or these ripples in space-time. So if I move my arms around in a circle, I'm technically creating gravitational waves, but I'm not creating very loud gravitational waves. My gravitational waves are very quiet. That's because my arms don't have a lot of mass to them. They're not particularly dense <laughs> uh, and I'm not moving all that fast. So we are trying to listen for very loud gravitational waves. And these are why we look at some of these more extreme scenarios of very compact stars orbiting around each other, such as neutron stars, and the more extreme scenario of binary black holes or black holes orbiting around each other. And for those of you who might be familiar with the idea of space-time, you might be saying, all right, hold on a second. This isn't what space-time looks like. We don't even, like space-time doesn't even have a look. <laughs> it exists throughout the fabric of the universe. This is just an analogy or a representation. And you're right. So when we think about gravitational waves, this is how we tend to represent it to wrap our minds around what's really happening. But what does a gravitational wave actually do? Um, what does a ripple in space-time 
mean? And that's where the detection of gravitational waves comes in. So what gravitational waves actually mean in space-time is that they're stretching distances in one direction and compressing them in another. And then they'll stretch and compress in the opposite way. So it's this stretching and compressing in a rhythmic mo motion, often, often called an oscillation, that's that ripple in space time. That's the gravitational wave. So it's a stretching and compressing of distances. And how do you measure the stretching and compression of distances? Well, you, lose the, you use the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO. LIGO is actually two separate detectors. One's in Hanford, Washington, and the other one is in Livingston, Louisiana. They're both four, kilometer lo four kilometers long each, the arms are, and they're at 90 degree angles. So then the next question is, well, what is a laser interferometer? A laser interferometer would be a very powerful laser on one end that comes out and hits a beam splitter. It shoots the laser down both arms, which are four kilometers long. The laser light comes back, it's balanced off the mirror. And if the arms are the exact same length of the right interval of wavelengths, it should cancel out completely. There's no leftover laser light. But if the arms are exactly the same length, that would mean it's the opposite of what we expect with gravitational waves. Gravitational waves is the stretching and compressing of distances. So what does that look like when it passes through a laser interferometer like LIGO? Well, you stretch in one direction and you compress in the other, and then it changes, which means that your arms are no longer the same length, they're no longer exactly four kilometers long or the same interval of wavelengths, and there is laser light left over. It no longer completely cancels out. And it's this leftover laser light that is directly caused by the changing of distances of the two arms related to each other that's the detection of gravitational waves. So listening for gravitational waves is largely waiting for this laser light or finding this residual laser light in the gravitational wave observatory, the laser interferometer. How small is this change of distances, however? Well, this is a hydrogen atom with an electron zipping around a proton, and each one of these white squares is 10 times smaller. So we're getting closer to our proton, 10 times smaller, 10 times smaller, 10 times smaller. And this is how much the distances change in those arms about one ten thousandth the width of a proton, of a proton. <laughs> and that's really small. That is wildly small, in fact. So these are very sensitive detections. They need to be very accurate. You need to be careful of background noise, which is something that I'm sure the last speaker is gonna be talking about a lot with the experiments of SNOW Lab. And how do you maintain an experiment that's looking for such precise measurements, such small detections? Well, you have a team of technicians and engineers and scientists that are maintaining the detectors and improving the technology almost on a continual basis. LIGO did indeed detect gravitational waves, however, despite how small they are. And the very first one detected was GW150914. It was detected in September of 2015, announced in January of 2016. And it led to the awarding of the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics to Rainer Rice, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne for their contributions to LIGO and gravitational wave theory, which was predicted by Albert Einstein in 1905. So you're talking about over 100 years later was the actual confirmation of gravitational waves in general relativity. Since that first detection, LIGO has been joined by Virgo. It's now the LIGO-Virgo collaboration. And Virgo is similarly a laser interferometer that's located in Italy. It's just outside of Pisa, actually. Think about the Leaning Tower of Pisa, think of Virgo. Why not go there? I don't know, it seems like a great tourist attraction to me. So the laser interferometer at Virgo is very, very similar to the one at LIGO, but it's a three kilometer long arm interferometer instead of four. Having more interferometers is kind of like having more than two ears. So one ear, you can hear some sounds, probably don't know where they are. Two ears, you can actually start locating where things are. And three ears, well, that's pretty accurate. You can probably pinpoint things much more clearly. And that's the benefit of having more of these laser interferometers operating. You're able to not just hear the gravitational waves, but also figure out more about where are they coming from in space. And since the LIGO-Virgo collaboration has gone into O2 and O3, these very different runs, there's been over 50 observations of binary black holes or two black holes orbiting around each other and merging. Not just that, however, there's also been a binary neutron star or two neutron stars that orbit around each other merge and basically explode in one of the most fantastic explosions ever observed ever. And you might just notice that it's not just gravitational waves here, but also light. So this particular merger was not just gravitational waves, it was also 
electromagnetic radiation or light, same type of light that the James Webb telescope would see. So you have your three detectors, your three gravitational wave detectors hearing the gravitational waves from this event, as well as over 70 telescopes and detectors on earth and in space that saw it. And this is one of the first instances of what we call multi-messenger astronomy, hearing the gravitational waves as well as seeing the electromagnetic counterpart of the same event in the universe, really opening our senses, all of them, uh, to the wonders of the cosmos. It's not just LIGO and Virgo, however, there's also a global network of detectors uh, that are operating. One of them is GEO 600 in Hanover, Germany, which has 600 meter long arms, and it's a big research and development facility. They actually created and developed the lasers that LIGO uses, as well as a newer um, laser interferometer called Kagra in Japan. And Kagra is the first underground laser interferometer. It's got three kilometer long arms each, and it's located in the Kamio Kande mine. For those of you who might be into neutrinos, that might ring a bell for Super Kamio Kande, which led to the awarding of the 2002 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of supernova neutrinos. And this is a photo of the mine tunnel that the Kagra, um, wait, the Kagra interferometer arms go down through. The LIGO Virgo Kagra collaboration, which is now the current iteration of gravitational wave detectors in the world, this past summer announced that they did successfully see gravitational waves, or rather hear gravitational waves from a black hole neutron star merger, which is improving our understanding of the different types of systems that exist in the universe. So now we've got over 50 detections of binary black holes, we've got detections of binary neutron stars, and we've got a detection, two actually, of a black hole neutron star merger. So they were 10 days apart and they were detected in January 2020 and released over the summer. Right now, LIGO, Virgo, Kagra are offline because they're doing upgrades and improving their instruments and they're estimated to start detection together as a global network after August of 2022. So we've got lots of detectors operating uh, or going to be operating again very soon, as well as a planned detector in, in India. So this is part of the LIGO collaboration as well, and they're, they're figuring out where exactly it's gonna be built, but that will add to this global network. This is not the end of gravitational wave detection and understanding the universe through gravitational waves. There's a third generation that's being prepared and coming out, including the Einstein telescope, which is figuring out exactly where it's gonna be built right now. Uh, they're gonna set a, a place in 2024, and then they're gonna start construction in 2026. This is going to be a new third wave of gravitational wave detectors built in Europe. It's going to have 10 kilometer long arms, new laser physics, new optics, and cryogenics that's going to make it about 10 times more sensitive than LIGO Virgo Cagra. In addition to that, there's the LISA or ELIS emission, which is the laser interferometer space antenna, and that's estimated to launch in 2034. Um, if you think people are excited for James Webb, that's just as excited as gravitational wave astrophysicists are excited about LISA. It's gonna be a huge array of satellites that are gonna follow Earth in its orbit around the sun. The arms are gonna be 2.5 million kilometers in length, and it's estimated to hear a lot more different types of systems in the universe, including galaxy mergers, which is gonna open up a lot more about what we understand in our cosmos. There is also the Cosmos Explorer. I don't have a timeline for that one. They haven't been, it's not really clear when that's going to get approved, but that's also a third generation gravitational wave detector that's estimated for the United States. And so with that, um, there's lots of resources. These collaborations are very transparent about their science and about when they release their data. I encourage you to go check it out. And also all of the simulations that I showed in this presentation were made by um, the collaboration I worked with during my PhD, which is the Simulating Extreme Space Times Collaboration or SXS. Have to take questions. Thank you, CJ. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, these the whole concept of these like hearing the universe is just like we've been listening for so long, but now we can hear. When do we get to smell? <laughs> and I actually, and I, I would think Lamia might even have an answer to that question. Um, you know, I feel like the nice thing about seeing exoplanet atmospheres is maybe you can start imagining what they smell like. But we'll come back to that. Um, so I do encourage everybody at home to uh, write in your questions. We have a few coming in. Uh, Craig had the first one, and you started to answer it, but not all the pieces as you kept talking. And that was how many waves, how many gravitational wave events have been detected since the instruments went online? And in his opinion, 
why so few? Um, is there a distance or what limitations like kind of constrain how often we hear them or, or, you know, is it distance? Is it the power? Like what are the things that impact whether or not we're going to hear something that happens? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And it has <laughs> so many facets. <laughs> There's actually a lot of reasons um, to why we hear the amount that, I shouldn't say we because I'm not active in the field anymore, but why LIGO, Virgo, Cogra, and other gravitational detectors hear the amount that they do and why not more or different kinds and why does it take so long to hear them and so on and so forth. So I guess uh, the first part of the question was how many and there's been on the order of 50 in total. I said earlier in the talk of those 50 binary black holes that were discovered. And because there hasn't been a whole lot of binary neutron stars and the first two binary, the first two black hole neutron star mergers were detected and released earlier this summer and they were actually detected in January, 2020. It's on that order of like 50 to 60. There's lots of candidates, I will say. So when we're talking about candidates, things that haven't been fully um, confirmed as detections, we're talking about, you know, possibly up in the hundreds. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to keep up, honestly, when LIGO, Virgo, and now Cogra release their data sets, because when they release it, it's like an explosion of realization that, yeah, this is actually a real detection. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of hard to answer on like a rolling basis. <laughs> How many <laughs> are there? Because it kind of just is increasing. And for a while, LIGO, Virgo had this habit of like announcing a couple every day, which was just impossible. I was going to say, I had the app. And so it would... Yeah. And, and, the notification sound was the whoop, you know, the, oh, the blip. <laughs> and so like, I'd be hanging out and then every now and then, I mean, it was literally sometimes multiple a day with a whoop and it would be like, there's a possible detection and tell me how likely it was that it was real, but you know, all the follow-up needs to go in before they, they decide, I guess that's the difference between the candidates and, and uh, whether it's confirmed. Exactly. So in terms of the number confirmed, it's in that like 50, 60 range, but in terms of the candidates, which are not necessarily not actual gravitational waves, it's just we're not the, um, the significance to them isn't quite as high as LIGO, Virgo and Cogra have set, which is actually very mm -hmm. high, by the way, like the science that goes into this and the background that goes into confirming these events is extraordinary. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the candidates aren't, it's just that it, they haven't, they don't have the confidence in them that they'd like to. Um, that's much, much higher. In terms of why we haven't seen more, well, one is the detectors need to be very sensitive to view them. And unfortunately they tend to be offline a lot. <laughs> um, so LIGO was actually running between 2002 and 2010 and it didn't see anything or hear anything. And it's largely because the sensitivity wasn't as low as it needed to be. Um, almost as soon as it came online again in 2015, it started detecting real gravitational waves from binary black holes. It went online literally the day that it detected GW 159914. Wow. So I mean, <laughs> lucky. <laughs> it's just, the sensitivity is a big one. Um, Were they sad when the next day they didn't see one and the next day they didn't see one? Like, well, they hit on the first day. <laughs> right. So then that's actually part of the question is um, I also mentioned how there's gravitational waves all the time, but a lot of them are very quiet. And there's also gravitational waves that don't look the same in terms of their waveform. So it's not quite the same pattern that you might expect. So there's actually a lot of pieces in terms of determining whether it's a gravitational wave. So some of it is how loud it is or the amplitude, as well as um, what the waveform looks like. That's kind of you know what physics is going into it, how fast the black holes are spinning or how fast the compact objects are spinning. All mm -hmm. that has a contribution. But the other part, which is correct, is um, how far away you can see. And that actually is directly related to how strong the gravitational waves are, or how loud they are. So it kind of all comes back to how sensitive is your detector and how loud those gravitational waves are. Uh, we can make estimates based on how far away you can see, you can listen, I guess, um, with estimates of how large the black holes are and things like that. But it really comes down to how loud is that gravitational wave and how sensitive is your detector to be able to pick that up which is why we're excited for these third generation, which are gonna have even lower sensitivities. So you can actually hear more of the universe and likewise, listen further. Cool. All right, there's a question in from Mitch, which says, what do you think is the most exciting opportunity or discovery from the new telescope, these new observatories? I think something most exciting. So it's very uh, self-serving, unfortunately. <laughs> what I think is gonna be really exciting about them is learning more about these black hole systems that we've already, not the ones that we've already seen, but the same category of the ones that we've already kind of identified. Um, I'm really interested to learn more about black hole spin 
and mm-hmm. that contribution, which we don't actually have like a really good handle on yet because we don't have enough of those detections, again, relating back to how many you've been able to hear. Um, so I'm really excited to learn more about the parameters of the black holes themselves, which we should be able to learn about from the detections of gravitational waves, but you can only know so much with a very small with a very small data set and, uh, and the and just the amount of ones that we've had so far. Um, I think another one that's gonna be really exciting is galaxy mergers. It is expected that some of these third generation gravitational wave observatories aren't going to be like singular objects merging, like these binary black holes and these binary neutron stars. It's also going to be galaxies that orbit around each other and eventually merge. And you can imagine the gravitational waves from that would be very loud, but they're going to be really slow. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like an echo, if you will. And it's expected that some of these third generations might be able to pick up some of those more nuanced gravitational waves. Fun fact, this would kind of be like the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy merging because we are on collision. We are on a course yeah. to, to collide and merge. This is That's the same type of situation that these other gravitational observatories are kind of expecting to hear when they come online. Oh, wow. So Vikram asks, is there any chance of hearing from beyond the cosmic microwave background using LISA or any of the other planned detectors? Yeah, I was honestly expecting it to be like from beyond the grave. <laughs> because I'm already in Halloween mode, so I apologize. For that. <laughs> Can we hear gravitational waves from beyond the grave? No, <laughs> um, that would be wild. But uh, in terms of from like, you know, beyond the cosmic microwave background, that is an active field of research. And that's an active field of like building the theory in terms of what would that mean in terms of what would you actually hear or see in the detector? Um, I'm not going to say no, and I'm not going to say yes, <laughs> because mm-hmm. it is kind of this flip-flop question of what does it mean to be able to see beyond the CMB? Mm-hmm. And what does that mean to be able to hear beyond the CMB? Right now, I think the theories that are building for that really imply that there should be some gravitational wave remnants from the Big Bang, and you should be able to, mm-hmm. um, you know, with a sense enough detector, with the right equipment, with a long enough detecting span, you should be able to confirm gravitational waves from the Big Bang and the the time between the CMB and the Big Bang itself. Um, but it's hard for me to say right now. <laughs> it's hard to say like yes or no, because it's it's not really, um, there's there's two sides to that argument, but I think right now the, the research and the data for it are very much in the field of, yes, there should be something and we may be able to detect it. Cool. I think actually one of our speakers in January, Simran Narval, I think she talks specifically about that topic. So Vikram, I encourage you, if you want to hear more of ours, to tune in to the January 2021 event. I think it was January 28th. We had Simran Nerval, whose specific focus was the idea of maybe detecting those gravitational waves from the very first moments of the Big Bang. Um, I think there could be some more information just kind of growing on exactly what CJ just said. I think we're slowly running out of time. So I think there's time for two more questions. Um, Sean had the question, if you have two gravitational waves of similar or equal value and they collide, what happens? Do they pass through each other? Do they cancel out? Something else weird and esoteric? Something else weird and esoteric. I love it. Um, So that's like, that's a really interesting question. So the way that I've been presenting gravitational waves is in the way that they're like sound waves. And you can imagine that when sound waves interact, they amplify each other and or they destructively um, interfere with each other. And then they kind of cease to exist in some cases or they change in that interaction. The gravitational waves are not really sound waves, (laughs) Uh, but I think that's a really valid point. That's a really valid question. So um, the idea of gravitational waves right now is that they would propagate through space time without necessarily being interfered with by other gravitational waves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they're not really um, they're not really like sound waves in the way that they can destruct they can constructively interfere in, or deinterfere. There's also a little bit more to gravitational waves than the actual sound waves themselves. There's also echoes, uh, which you can consider like their imprint on space time. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that. So. I think the short answer is no, but there's actually a lot of really cool physics to that question. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'd, I'd encourage you to go look at the echoes of gravitational waves and that sort of thing, which is a little, a little bit more um, that I'm comfortable with approaching in an astronomy on top. Mm-hmm. Okay, the last question for now, but there are a few more, which we'll save for the panel. 
um, which is do the gravitational waves lose energy as they travel through space? Yes, hmm. they do. And that's exactly what I was trying to get at with um, saying that, you know, there's a limit to how far away you can hear with these gravitational mm -hmm. waves, and, but that's really related to the strength. And that's really, you know, if you have a very intense event that creates very strong gravitational waves, you know, something like two very, very big black holes moving around each other very, very fast as they merge. That's technically, we would be able to hear that from much further away because by the time it gets to earth, it's dissipated versus two smaller black holes, say stellar mass black holes um, that, that merge, they would need to be a lot closer for us to actually hear their gravitational waves because they're still losing energy as they propagate. So yes, there is, a, there is an energy loss as they propagate through space. Huh. All right, well, I don't want them to be too close because I feel like that would, be, that would be a little scary to have this happening too close. Oh, yeah. I, well, we'd be dead, right? <laughs> that would suck. Yeah, yeah, not, not the best way to go. <laughs> um, all right, well, thank you so much. And we'll, I look forward to having you back a little bit more for some maybe last minute thoughts and questions at the end. But I really want to thank you again for that amazing talk on, on gravitational wave observatories. My pleasure. Cool. And so I am going to do the second round of trivia. It's what you've all been waiting for. And remember that the link for the trivia is in the, uh, in the description of YouTube. And so I know we are slipping a little bit on time. We have too many good questions. Um, and so I want to dive right in. And so I want you to name this object. What is this? And I, I will tell you it's a real picture with some data folded in, but it's, uh, it's an object and what is it? So that's question number six. Question number seven is in the movie Interstellar, there's a wormhole. The wormhole is placed beside which planet? And again, a hint, it is in our solar system. All right, which planet is the interstellar wormhole next to? Question number eight, and I will go through these one more time. Where on the moon did people first land a spacecraft? What is the location on the moon? Where on the moon did people first land a spacecraft? What's that location called? Question number nine, the astronomical unit, also known as an AU, is a unit of measurement based on the average distance between which two bodies? The astronomical unit. Not to be confused with the astrological unit, which maybe is the difference between the two horoscope entries in your magazine. <laughs> I made that up on the spot. The astronomical unit is a unit of measurement based on the average distance between which two bodies? Question number nine. And the last question for round two is, what must a meteor do in order to become a meteorite? Meteor is evolving into a meteorite. What must it do to be able to become a meteorite? Okay, and I'm gonna quickly just go through the questions one more time before we bring on our last but not least speaker. Question six, name this object shown here. Question seven, in the movie Interstellar, the wormhole was placed besides which planet? Which planet in our solar system? Question number eight, where on the moon did people first land a spacecraft? Where on the moon was that? Number nine, the astronomical unit, the AU, is a unit of measurement based on the average distance between which two bodies? And last but not least, what must a meteor do in order to become a meteorite? And so we're gonna come back very soon to show you the answer to these 10 questions. So please get in your answers soon if you want to be included in the prize draw. But from now on, I want to move to our next speaker. And so I'd like to introduce Christine. So Christine, if you would like to share your camera. So our final speaker tonight is Christine Krauss. 
Christine completed her PhD in 2004 at the Johannes Gutenberg Universität de Mainz, so that's in Germany, focusing on the final measurements of the Mainz neutrinos mass experiment. This experiment set the best limit on neutrino mass for about 10 years. And then following her PhD, she did a postdoc at Queen's University here in Kingston, working on the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment. Be curious to hear just how much time you get to spend uh, here in Kingston versus up there at Snow Lab. Before then, you came to Snow Lab where you are now as a research scientist working on Snow Plus before also moving to Laurentian, also in Sudbury, um, where Christine earned a Canada Research Chair tier, tier two in particle astrophysics. Christine's main research focus is now the Snow Plus experiment, a multi purpose neutrino detector. She is the site activity coordinator for the collaboration, which means she is responsible for supervising visiting scientists and ensuring that work on the experiment is done correctly and in order. And tonight, Christine will tell us more about Snow Lab, Canada's world class undergraduate, underground. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, underground science facility. And so, Christine, thank you so much for being part of our, our event tonight. I really look forward to hear what you have to say about your science in Snow Lab and uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction. Just have to get to full screen mode. It's hiding behind the panel here. There we go. So yeah, um, Snow Lab uh, basically was built on the success of the already mentioned famous snow experiment. And you see a, a little indication here of what this looks like. Um, it is a large acrylic vessel. Uh, the, this neck you see is seven meters high and the diameter of this ball is 12 meters, um, which is surrounded by light sensitive detectors. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge, and I think people are aware, uh, that this was one half of the Nobel Prize awarded in 2015. Um, and Snow was looking at neutrinos coming from the sun. Uh, so these neutrinos taught us a few things. Uh, they, they taught us that neutrinos do have mass. Um, and it also helped um, letting us know that we have a pretty good idea of how our sun actually works and produces energy which is very nice. So Snow Lab is located in Sudbury, Ontario. Um, there's a surface facility where you see a picture on the left top here, uh, but the actually, actual facility is located two kilometers deep underground. Um, you can see on the top right in the picture what is called the shaft. So that's the vertical uh, way that everything gets down, every piece of equipment, every person, whoever goes there, goes down uh, with a cage through that shaft. And then we have another about 1.6 kilometer long book, uh, walk to get to the lab. Uh, bottom left gives you a rough layout of what this looks like. And the bottom right has a picture of a few people walking through these so-called drifts, um, making it to the lab. So you might be asking yourself, uh, why are we doing this? Why are we going deep underground? Um, and I already threw in here that we also want to make sure that everything is extremely clean, uh, which is not so easy in a working mine. And part of the answer is that we're looking for extremely rare events, but we'll come back to that. So why are we going underground? Um, well, if we would try and build these same detectors on the surface, uh, they would light up like a Christmas tree, kind of what you see in the top. Um, and would it make it very, very hard to see what we're looking for, these types of wings? This is actually a picture from the Snow Times. Um, that's what a neutrino signal might look like. And the reason why it's difficult on the surface is because there's radiation coming in from the cosmos, uh, cosmic radiation. And as it uh, works its way through our atmosphere, it interacts and it creates a whole cascade, a whole pile of new particles. And in order to get away from them, um, we go deep underground. So Snow Lab focuses on what we call particle astrophysics and in particular research around neutrinos and research around dark matter. Um, and we'll take a little bit more time to talk about each of them in, in very general terms. So uh, neutrinos come in more than one flavor. Uh, that is important to keep in mind. And for dark matter, uh, we're still really trying to figure out what exactly that is. Uh, we know it's not visible matter. Um, neutrinos are actually part of the dark matter, but there might be a whole pile of other 
of other candidates and you see some of the names listed here on the right. So why are we interested in that? Um, so by now we can actually kind of make this pie chart and have some kind of idea of what is our universe built of, like how does everything get distributed? And I wanna draw your attention to the, the little orangey red part. Uh, so this is what we call bionic matter. Um, and it's split up here on the right hand side. Most of that is hydrogen and helium, so the lighter elements. Um, everything the stars are made of is a, is a portion of that. And as I mentioned, the neutrinos are part of that and then heavier elements, which are created in supernovas and we'll, we'll come back to those as well. Um, but looking at this, it's actually quite disappointing that we only know very well about 5% of our universe. So the next biggest chunk is that black chunk is dark matter. So it makes perfect sense for us to try and figure out what that is. And I won't have time uh, to go into what dark energy is, but I'll give you a little bit of an, of an idea. We know that our universe is expanding. Uh, we know that it's accelerating while doing so. And dark energy is what we think is responsible for, for that part, but we really don't have a good idea of what exactly that is yet. So sticking with the dark matter for a minute, um, at Snow Lab, we have many different detectors that are looking for it. Um, and I put on, on top there, how do you do that? So you take what you know. So we know it's there from indirect observations. Uh, we know that it has mass, significant mass, much, much more than, than all the things we know about. So in very simple terms, we would expect it to behave like matter. So if it bumps into some kind of target, some kind of detector material, then it should deposit some energy and we can look for that. We can look for that if we make sure that we have enough target mass and that we minimize everything else that could look very similar. Uh, and because we don't know very much, it is very useful to utilize different techniques for that. Um, so here's a few pictures of, um, of six of the experiments that are currently up and running at Snow Lab that are doing that. Uh, some of them use targets that are made out of gas. Some of them are use targets that are made out of fluid. Some of them use targets that are made out of solids. And all of them have slightly different energy ranges uh, to look at as broad a spectrum of these types of dark matter candidates as you can. So switching gears a little bit, um, I want to talk a little bit about supernova neutrinos. Um, supernovas is, or a supernova is one of the possible end stages of the life of a star. Uh, our own sun can't turn into a supernova, it doesn't have enough mass, but many others do. Um, and when they do, uh, it goes through a process where there's, um, once the the hydrogen is all burned out. Um, it goes to heavier and heavier elements until it can't anymore. Um, and that can end up in a supernova explosion. And it turns out that neutrinos are released very early on and most of the energy of this explosion is released as neutrinos. So that makes them very good messengers um, and they, they can then um, try to reach us. And it shouldn't see faster than light um, <laughs> that way. But it does mean that if we look for neutrinos, we can see the supernova a lot earlier as if we wait for the signal in light later on. And what we do there is we are looking for bursts. Uh, neutrinos don't really like to interact very much. So in normal days, we have to be very patient to wait for them. But if there would be a supernova explosion and that has to be close enough, which pretty much means in our own galaxy, uh, then we would see a fair number of neutrinos in a very short amount of time. And by very short, I mean something like on the order of 10 seconds. And that's what we call a burst. So that makes, uh, makes this very interesting. But unfortunately, because we're limited in the reach, um, supernova explosions in our own galaxy don't happen that often. So those experiments have to be very patient. We think that that happens maybe two or three times in a hundred years. So I just wanna introduce two detectors that uh, can look for that at Snow Lab. Uh, the first one of those is HALO. 
which stands for the Helium and Lab Observatory. And you can see a picture of it here. And this is a dedicated supernova detector, um, which is very interesting because of what I just said, you have to actually be very patient. So this particular one is, has been built out of recycled components. Um, the target here is lead, which is these green blocks. Um, and if the neutrinos interact with that lead, they create neutrons. And then the things you see in between is material inherited from the snow experiment. Uh, they are um, helium-3 counters, and they are extremely sensitive to neutrons. Uh, so that's the detection principle for this particular detector. And you want it to be more or less running all the time because you don't want to miss these 10 seconds. Um, so that one has been running since 2012. It's the longest running snow lab experiment as this, at this point, but still waiting. So the other detector um, I want to just touch on that can also see supernovas is uh, Snow Plus. And you on the left hand side, you see a picture of us replacing some photomultipliers uh, that had broken during the snow time and were replaced and then reintroduced so that we have more detectors looking for these light flashes. And on the right hand side, you can see another picture of the inside and overlaid one of the supernova remnants. And so here we do have a scintillator material inside, uh, so the interactions will mostly be with carbon. Uh, but the principle stays the same. We are looking for bursts uh, should we see some supernovas form, uh, some neutrinos form a supernova, which would be really nice. So looking forward a little bit. Um, so I've, so far I've shown you detectors that are currently up and running and uh, many of them want to continue for a while. Um, but just to give you an idea, um, at SnowLab right now, the numbers on the right-hand side are recent numbers. Um, but over the next um, set of strategic plan times, so the rest of this decade, uh, SnowLab will expect the community of scientists to grow. So right now there's uh, over 800 users uh, from over 120 institutions and from 23 countries. So with that in mind, here's a layout of the Snow Lab facility. Uh, and I circled two things. So the blue circle is the original cavern for the snow experiment that now Snow Plus is using. And then you see the uh, uh, first expansion that officially opened in 2012, but the planning started quite a bit earlier. There's two new caverns um, on, the, on the top. That's the so-called cryo pit and then the so-called cupole. And then I circled in green this little stab there, um, because one of the things that might happen is that there won't be enough space for all the experiments that uh, might be interesting to do there. Uh, so there has been a study commissioned uh, to see if the lab could be expanded and if more cavern could be built. Um, and the answer is yes, it's possible, but at this point there are no concrete plans to do so. And I think that's all I have. Thank you so much. It's it's such a fascinating like facility that's just right here in Canada. And so it's so cool that you're able to give us a tour of all the different experiments and the layout of the land. So I do encourage everybody at home to uh, let us know your questions. Um, Sean did ask, what is the most powerful wave yet detected? And um, are there larger ones? And can they pose a risk of issues for anything with human? And so I'm thinking, and he has reworded the question. Um, I've asked him, and maybe you can clarify, Sean, by wave, I'm thinking he means like wave of neutrinos that could come from like a supernova, mm -hmm. um, or this is maybe also a question that we'll come back to for CJ, which is gravitational wave, but I think he did mean. But I, maybe I'll put that question to you about, um, you, you highlighted for neutrinos for halo, um, they, they need to be nearby. Um, so yeah. it seems like uh, I'm thinking our own galaxy, you said a couple times a century. We also have like the large Magellanic cloud where we had supernova 1987A. I'm trying to think like how far away does a supernova, can a supernova be where we would still see that here on, on Earth and that's in the lab? 
Yeah, that's right. So it depends a little bit on the size of your detector. Uh, so the, the current version of HALO is, is fairly small. Um, uh, what comparison? It's it's about uh, three times three meters and a little bit longer than that. Um, so if you would build a larger detector, and there are actually plans to do that, uh, to to build a larger version of this, but in Italy in another underground lab there at Quinsasso, then you would increase that sensitivity, right? So if you make your target a little bit larger, and um, depending on how large you can really make that, maybe you can reach kind of the next galaxy, maybe. It depends also on how much um, energy these neutrinos have from the supernova, not every supernova is equal. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of when do we have to be scared, um, we want it close by, but not too close. Um, we don't want it to be, you know, right next door. We want it to be far enough that it uh, it doesn't deposit so much energy from the explosion on Earth that it impacts us. Mm -hmm. So can I continue hoping that Beetlejuice goes at any day or is it too close? Beetlejuice would be a great candidate. Yeah, we're all hoping <laughs> for, for that one. Uh, I mean, we like you in the sky, but you can go. We're, we're okay with it. Uh, Craig had a question, which is following up for, I think, on the space news that I mentioned, where he's wondering, can axions be detected with any of the experiments at Snow Lab? Yeah, so right now, the experiments at Snow Lab are not sensitive to axions. They are looking for what we would call WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, mm -hmm. um, and just focusing on the entire parameter space there. Uh, the detection principle for axions is quite different. So the one you showed was uh, was from CAST, uh, the one that's mm -hmm. built at CERN. Um, so no, not currently. I see. I had a question, which is, and, and you highlighted it in your slides, that the supernova, could you clarify a little bit about what it means for neutrinos to reach us much faster than the light? Right. That seems um, like it's not supposed to happen that way, but. Yeah. So if I go back to our own sun, I think that's a nice example. We know we, it can't be a, a turning supernova, but it shows nicely the difference between uh, light and neutrinos. So if we look at our sun, we just look up, we see basically a picture in light. Mm -hmm. But what we see is thousands of years ago, because um, the light will bounce around inside the sun. It's a fairly dense, um, dense object for quite some time before it comes out. Once it leaves the outside of the, the sun, it takes it eight minutes to travel to the Earth. But the neutrinos, because they don't really like to interact an awful lot, they don't really care that the sun is, is, is very dense. So they don't have these thousands of years of bouncing around. And because they don't have an awful lot of mass, they travel pretty close to the speed of light. And we are pretty close to it. So they also take about eight minutes, maybe slightly bit longer. Hmm. So if we look at the sun in neutrinos, we get a picture that's only eight minutes old. Hmm. So if we then extrapolate that to supernovas, that's the same thing, right? So the, the neutrinos carry most of the energy. Uh, they start traveling without bouncing around an awful lot of time first. Um, so uh, we should be able to see the onset of, um, of a supernova in neutrinos between, you know, tens of minutes and several hours before the light signal would show up. Mm -hmm. And that is very really exciting. So there's a worldwide network of these types of detectors that's called SNOOS, a Supernova Early Warning System. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a gigantic email list to let everybody <clears throat> who might be interested know, because so far uh, we have not been able to observe the onset of supernova in the light signals. Mm -hmm. I feel like we've been very unlucky with our supernova rates. I, Beetlejuice, like really, you can go any day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that actually made me think of something, which is, is there, because you're saying the light coming from the sun, essentially, after bouncing around, takes like a thousand years or so. So we're seeing like the light, it seems to be telling us a little bit about what the sun was doing in the past compared to neutrinos right now. Is there any indication that the central, the center of the sun has changed in any way? Is there any like in, in the last thousand or so years, like based on those two data sets? Ah, that's a very interesting question. Um, there, are, there are changes on the, on the smaller scale all the time, um, mm -hmm. but big general changes on the order of a thousand years, it's still short time scales on, on lifetimes of stars. Of course, yeah, I see. Um, okay, Sean has a question is, can neutrinos be harmful to us? 
Like, can you have so many that they could be? We would love to have so many that they could. So no, uh, there's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, let me give you some numbers. I mean, there's billions of them going through the little bit of your thumb every second. That's one of the numbers people like. But ah. the one I particularly like, if we take an average person, average weight, and see they live about 70 years, um, then with all these neutrinos coming all the time, uh, one of them will interact with something in your body once in your lifetime. <laughs> All right, maybe we like and it that yeah, way. <laughs> you might be very, very sensitive. Maybe you feel a little tickle when the neutrino comes. <laughs> very good. Um, Mitch is a question about Snow Plus. Um, he understands that its, it's focus is on neutrinoless double beta decay. Yes, that's Just right. wondering if you would uh, maybe explain a little bit, in, like briefly, what that kind of discovery would be. Sure. Um, so, I'll have to start with the beta decay first. So we, we know kind of three types of radioactivity that we call um, alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, beta radiation or beta decay is basically release electrons and antineutrinos. Mm -hmm. um, so that happens all the time for a fair number of elements. But there's a subset of elements where energetically that's not advantageous. So you, we would call this, it's a forbidden decay to have the ordinary single beta decay. And these can undergo what we would call a double beta decay, which you can imagine as two happening in parallel at the same time. So in that, we get two electrons and two antineutrinos out. So then the neutrino is very interesting because it is a neutral particle. So it has the option to kind of be its own antiparticle. Normally, if you turn a particle into an antiparticle, it would flip its charge, like right. the electron and positron. Yeah. But neutrinos don't have to do that because they are neutral. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what we call a Majorana particle named after the physicist who first proposed that uh, quite some time ago in the 1930s, somewhere 40s. Mm -hmm. um, and that then would allow for the fact that maybe you could have uh, one of these double beta decays where you don't get the neutrinos out because the one that uh, gets created on one side could, if it changes just a little bit, so it flips what we call a spin or the you know combination of spinning and, and traveling, it could be reabsorbed by the other one at the same time. So we would only see the electrons. These types of things are extremely rare. Um, it would violate a basic symmetry because the number of what we call leptons before and after wouldn't be the same. It would change by the factor of two because the two neutrinos, mm. antineutrinos are missing. And this is very, very interesting when we're thinking about what our universe is made of, um, because our universe is made out of matter and not antimatter. And we haven't really right. understood why that's the case. So uh, <laughs> seeing something like that would really help us maybe understand a little bit better what happened, why is the matter left over? Because matter and antimatter in principle should be created equally. So we need to find some kind of process that made more matter than antimatter. So I think there's one more question, which I saw, which is like, what is the process for an experiment getting put at Snow Lab? <laughs> That's a very good question. And um, so I did hint on everything has to go down the same way. Um, so you do have to plan very well. Um, mm. This is still an active mine. So the, the mining company will want to use the, this one vertical axis most of the time. Um, everything you bring down has to fit through the shaft and through the drift. Uh, so you want to make sure that you, wow. all your bits and pieces are small enough and you assemble it underground. The time we can spend there is limited. Um, so yeah, very careful planning um, and, uh, and time. <laughs> and that's also why I, all these experiments I mentioned are international collaboration. So this is not something that a handful right. of people just do over a weekend. <laughs> Very good. Well, I mean, it's it's really fascinating, and it's I'm curious to see you know what what happens next for in Snow Lab's future. Um, Christine, I think that's the last question we have time for for now. I want to thank you again. We are running a little bit late, but um, I know people are some people are still hanging around. Um, I think I'm going to reveal trivia, and then we'll bring you back along with the panel, and we'll we'll wrap up the night. But thanks again. And let me get the time for the reveal, although I might cheat and skip ahead for one reason. First, 
which is as we near the end, I think it's this one. I do want to to advertise that we have uh, another event that will be a hybrid event in person and online, um, which will be uh, the Georgia Maureen Ewan Lecture featuring the director of CETA. So that's Dr. Gina Kohlmeyer. She will be speaking um, a little bit about her experiences as a scientist and talking about her work with SDSS um, and, and, and more. Um, and so do tune in on November 29th at 7.30. Right now, I don't have the information for how to connect, but um, we will have that on then. So I hope you can tune in. For some reason, none of my titles are coming up, so I can't tell. Uh, here we go. So with that said, I want to reveal the answers to the trivia. We saw which Renaissance scientist is credited with the discovery of the pendulum's uh, length period relationship, and that led to the pendulum clock. Well, that would be Galileo in 1602, just before he got busy with telescopes in 1609. And so, you know, him, he was responsible for a lot of things. And so here's actually, I think, one of his pictures of looking at what a pendulum is doing. So Galileo would, would be accepted there. Who is the first to formulate that all matter is made of particles? And you could go a little bit broad with this. We would accept the ancient Greeks, and you get a bonus point if you specifically said Democritus. That's a very, very long time ago. Which planet has a hexagonal shaped storm? Well, that's Saturn. There have been times where one has appeared on some of the other gas giants, but Saturn is a little bit most famous for, for that uh, behavior. Name the scientist. Of course, that's Carl Sagan himself. Question five is a little bit of a trick question, especially if you're in the middle of the show and you maybe don't want to see spoilers. Which of the following TV shows or movies do not allow people to travel faster than light? Of the options of Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, Star Trek, Firefly, and The Expanse, technically speaking, the only answer is Firefly. But that maybe comes with a little bit of spoilers if you're still only on the first three seasons of The Expanse. And so we'll accept The Expanse too. And then round two of trivia, the first was name this object. And that was the event horizon and accretion disk of the supermassive black hole in the galaxy N87. And if you even just said a black hole or supermassive black hole, if you said M87, we will accept almost any of those. But it's a fascinating picture. I think we highlighted when the original picture was taken. The, so this is from the Event Horizon Telescope. Recently, this is something I almost put into space news, but I saved it for this. They were able to actually get some information about the magnetic fields in this. And they've, I believe, put in, uh, so these lines are, some, are indicating what that magnetic field is doing in the accretion disk. In the movie Interstellar, the wormhole was placed beside which planet? Well, that was Saturn. Um, you can see that a little bit of shot here as they go into the wormhole. I often wondered if this was a reference to the 2001 Space Odyssey book, where the third monolith is on the moon around Saturn, not to be confused with the movie where it was around Jupiter. And of course, the monolith becomes this the Stargate. And so I think there's an interest. Maybe Christopher Nolan was thinking about that when. Uh, they decided to put it here at Saturn. Question eight, where on the moon did people first land the spacecraft? That would include where they themselves landed, and that's the Sea of Tranquility. So they landed right here in this extended area, this dark mare, the Sea of Tranquility. Number nine was the astronomical unit. The AU is a unit of measurement based on the average distance between what two bodies? Well, that's the sun and the earth. And we actually use that as a little bit of a, a reference, uh, a unit that we use to describe the distance to all the other, other planets. Um, from Mercury at like 0.3 AU, Venus at 0.7, Mars at 1.5 and so forth. And last but not least, question number 10, and I'm sorry, we're not doing a live grading tonight, so we will reach out to you after the fact with the winner information. Um, but what must a meteor do in order to become a meteorite? Well, it actually has to hit and survive um, the Earth's surface. And I took some pictures today, actually, of the uh, Viver uh, Douglas meteorite collection. 
um, which is located in Sterling Hall. And so uh, she donated um, some of uh, meteorites here. Um, Vibera Douglas was actually the first female astrophysicist in Canada. She was a professor at Queens. And so uh, it was nice to be able to go and see some of those meteorites. So indeed, that is all the trivia today. I hope that you guys got some of them right. We'll look through them after the fact and find out who wins the mug. But um, as a last little kind of farewell, there's a few questions we didn't get to. And so I do encourage all of tonight's speakers to come back on, hang out with us one last time. And uh, I wanna thank all of you again for fantastic talks from each of you about all the different facilities that are, you know, not all of them, but some of them I think the most exciting that are currently running or uh, about to be running that are gonna be opening up our eyes and ears apparently to the universe. Um, and so there's a few, uh, a few questions that have come in. I wanna thank the audience too for uh, paying attention and hanging out with us so long. Um, and so there's a number of, uh, a number of things and I don't even know that we have time for all of these questions. Don't wanna overstay our welcome with everybody tonight. But um, the first one I see is actually for you, Lumia. Um, from the simulation, it said like it was a 30 day mission to get to the final spot. Um, and maybe like, I, I don't know, like, there's no, there's, like, is that the end once it's there? Is it have more to do? You're saying there's calibrations to be taken, but is the entire process of kind of getting set up and ready to go that 30 day process? And what are like, yeah, I'm trying to think, like, is it is it going there very quickly? Is this on the same amount of speed that we would go to, say, Mars? Like, why, maybe why does it take that long or, or whatnot? Um, so I know that it has to cool down for a little bit. That's mm -hmm. one of the things that it has to do, the IR detector. Um, in terms of, I mean, the image taking will probably start soon mm -hmm. after. Words. It's just that making sure that all the instruments are running properly. So the first light will happen sooner than six months. Uh, mm -hmm. The six months time period is when the science data will be starting to take. So that before that, it's still engineering phase um, where you're commissioning the telescope, you're opening the all of the instruments up, taking images, and making sure that you know they're doing what they're supposed to do. Um, so that's the first six months of time. But yeah, after it reaches the uh, and the end of 29 days, when it reaches the L2, it's going to be orbiting the sun. Mm -hmm. So it will be orbiting the sun along with the earth. So um, mm -hmm. it's, it's different than HST, which was orbiting the earth, but this mm -hmm. one is going to be going around the sun itself. So um, it is going to be moving, uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's where it should stay at L2. I see. I have a question for all of you, but maybe we'll start with Christine. Um, I'm curious how, or in any way, COVID has affected what you talked about tonight, about the different facilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for Snow Lab, it, it did certainly have an impact. Um, the, the work didn't stop, um, but the number mm -hmm. of people who could go underground on a particular day or in a particular um, shift was very limited for, for certain times. Um, so in some sense, it would stretch out um, all the schedule. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the times with the highest numbers everywhere, especially early on, but it came back in, in the later waves as well, we would go into what we would call a care and maintenance time. So uh, you had less than 10 people, just a few shifts just during the day throughout the week, just to make sure that everything that can be run remotely stays up and running. Um, so no new construction, no nothing new, nothing um, special. And then depending on how the numbers overall were, that, that could increase and, and improve. But yes, it definitely had a huge impact on, on the work. Some, some experiments, depending on their state, if they're up and running, you kind of shift priorities and focus more on looking at the data you already had. Um, but if you're an experiment that's in a construction phase, it's very hard to do that, right? So, right, and that probably was the case, I guess, for for the JWST as well, as they were in the construction phase, right? I mean, was there any significant impact that happened because of COVID? 
Um, there wasn't a significant delay due to the COVID just because um, the last time that it got delayed, they took about two, they extended it by about two years. And I mm. think they left a lot of room for um, mm. things to go wrong again. Um, uh, so from what I understand, uh, there wasn't any delay that was attributed specifically to COVID. There was a delay. It was supposed to be, if I remember correctly, it was around... September or October was the previous date of this mm-hmm. year. And there was a delay to December and that was due to actually the Ariane 5 rocket. It, that had some malfunction. So that was not for the COVID. It was uh, about for the transport. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, all the instruments were already sent. It was being, um, everything was in the, uh, getting checked out but i think one of the things that everything is in the clean room when it comes to james well everybody is heavily uh masked and you know in the in a this hazmat kind of suits so maybe that's why it wasn't a big deal that they were already right. taking so much precaution <laughs> yeah well, that's interesting and cj i'm curious if you have any do you have you heard any stories or anything regarding about covid's impact on ligo or other other observatories I don't know any direct stories, but you know, it was very clear that LIGO had to slow down Operation Same with Virgo, uh, less on-site staff, changing in priorities, very similar to what Christine mentioned in Snow Lab. You just have to reduce the number of people and kind of focus on basic operations. Um, and then when they close down for upgrades, it's just taking a lot longer to implement those upgrades because, again, fewer people on site um, and so on and so forth. And in particular, the interferometer that was most affected by COVID was actually CAGRA. Um, they're start dates and everything got moved back by months because of COVID-19. And uh, the the timeline for 04, which is the next upcoming run for LIGO Virgo Cagra is getting progressively moved further and further later into 2022 because of consequences of COVID-19. So yeah, it has had a pretty big impact, but not necessarily on the instrument. It was just on the operation of them. Right. Uh, CJ, there's another question that was for you held over, which is the multi-messenger results that you highlighted. They they showed that gravitational waves do travel as expected at the speed of light. Were there any interesting or esoteric theories that were ruled out by that observation? Like, was there you know, was there reason to think or hope that maybe they didn't travel at the speed of light? So. I don't have a favorite alternative theory to gravity, <laughs> but um, yeah, definitely gravitational waves traveling at speed of light. And the fact that gravitational waves exist at all um, further supported general relativity. But any you know counteracting theories that are trying that you know are saying that gravitational like general relativity does not necessarily describe the universe, um, some of those were definitely disproved and whatnot. But I don't have a particular favorite one. Fair enough. I wanted to ask if any of you guys had questions for each other. And maybe while you think about that, I do have another question for Christine, which is um, like, what if we never find an explanation for the missing antimatter? Or or to say the least, like, if it's not, if neutrinos are not Majorana particles, what could be another reason for this kind of missing antimatter or the matter antimatter? uh asymmetry yeah again that's a very good question so it's not neutrinos are not the only option um there there could be other processes as you learn about the fundamental particles and how that all goes together that could cause that um there could be other symmetries that that participate into that Mm -hmm. um there's, there's lots of theories um but there has to be an explanation because we are here, right? Our universe is made out of matter. Um, so, so, so there definitely has to be an explanation, but it might take us a long time to really find it. Well, I think that's the last question from the audience. So yeah, does any, any other questions, comments, thoughts from each of you um, or for each other or whatnot before we, we close down the night? And maybe a question for CG, if I, if I may. Um, I, I'm very intrigued by the idea of building a, a you know, a gravitational wave detector in space. Uh, so maybe you can comment a little bit on what the challenges are. Uh, that one will be a lot bigger too, right? That's the idea. 
Um, so, so what would be the main, main hurdles that have to be overcome to make that one happen? Yeah, and I mean, I'm gonna miss a lot in my answer because <laughs> I did I never worked directly with Lisa or Elisa, but I imagine um, first of all, it's gonna meet a lot of the same uh, barriers that Lamia has mentioned with the James Webb Telescope. Um, you know, it has to go up in space, it has to get on the rocket, it has to be assembled in a clean room. It's also gonna be on a heliocentric orbit following behind the earth. So you need to do all the calculations for that. It's gonna be self-assembling, it's gonna be automatic. It's gonna meet a lot of the same hurdles. So, you know, big praise to WST for kind of meeting those first and I guess laying some of the groundwork. Um, but one of the big hurdles for Lisa has always been the funding, unfortunately. <laughs> I think funding is something that tends to get overlooked with these, with these huge apparatus and it's really Lisa, Lisa, it was the funding. They were talking about removing one of the satellites or uh, removing some of the technology in them to try and make them cheaper. Um, I'm happy to say that now, at least the plan is that you still have all three satellites and they're still gonna have three laser lights, uh, three laser arms. It's not gonna be these big tubes, obviously in space, it's just free forming lasers, it's already a vacuum. And uh, I say the next one is gonna be the automation of the technology because you need mm -hmm. to have you know, rockets keeping them in place as well as the mirrors and um, laser propagators. You need to have cryogenics working on those satellites as well to keep everything really, really cool. Um, even though it's in space, I know it seems weird, but that's, yeah, they, they need that too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's all that stuff together. So I'm not as familiar with exactly all of the barriers specifically, but the funding one was the big one. And the second one is that all the technology outside of the interferometer piece. Um, and CJ, I assume it will not be uh, serviceable as well. I don't know. I don't think so. That would be pretty wild because it's not like one piece. It's three separate satellites. And I'm a heliocentric and orbit, behind so. the earth. Like I can't imagine it being serviceable, but yeah. But SpaceX, pay attention. Come on, get, you know, get that technology ready so that we can do it. <laughs> but I, uh, yeah, I, it sounds, it sounds impractical. Hmm. Uh, any other any other thoughts or or, or questions or shall I um, call it? Christine, I had a question for you. Are there any merit, merits to having this um, dark matter, the, um, neutrino or any other detectors in in space rather than? Because I know that you don't want any other interaction, but are there any merits to having them in space? No, not not really. I mean, we you still have lots of things um, hiding you. You can get to them, um, getting the signals back to Earth. Uh, like the timing is very important for many of them. So no, I don't really see an advantage of having them in space. But we have been asked that before. <laughs> all right. Well, I want to thank you all again. I think we are out of time. And so I, I just really, really appreciate hearing from all three of you. Um, I, I, uh, I look forward to seeing where all these different facilities are gonna be going in the future. And so uh, to everybody at home, stay tuned. Just one last plug again, darkmatterday.com. Um, do look into that, look into the Snow Lab uh, event that's happening next week. Um, and then the Ewan lecture that's happening at the end of November. Um, I think you can uh, sign up for events on the mcdonaldinstitute.ca at the bottom of the page, and then you can be notified when those happen. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great night. Take care.